start with parties and race in the southern states in general. Most of the southern states are made up of a majority of whites and a minority of blacks, and there's not much else racial diversity throughout the southern states, at least in most. Florida is different. But let's start by understanding whites and blacks in the South in general. So if we go back in time to the 1930s, white Southerners were solidly Democratic. And black Southerners, if they could vote, they were solidly Republican, but it was rare for them to vote because that was the Jim Crow era. And there were all kinds of tricks that were used to keep them from voting. I'm not really going into that in this video, but I'm pretty sure your textbook discusses it. So, we go forward to about the 1950s. White Southerners are getting a little less loyal to the Democratic Party. An increasing number of them consider voting Republican just for president. And Eisenhower wins a few Southern states, including the state of Florida. We go into the 1960s. Uh, blacks are about to make some major advances. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement has really picked up steam, and in 1964, a white Southern Democrat, Lyndon Baines Johnson, um, as president, he signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and more importantly, as far as elections go, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Not only does this uh, guarantee that blacks will now have the right to vote, but it also wins them over to the Democratic Party. Since that time, blacks have been pretty solidly Democrat, and to this day, blacks will vote about 95% Democratic. So where does that leave white Southerners? Well, they still are the majority in the South, and for the most part, they're still Democrats, but they don't really trust the National Democratic Party as much as they used to. So if we go into the late 60s, into the 70s, even into the 80s, here's what you begin to see. White Southerners are solidly Democratic still at the state and local level. White Southern Democratic politicians are increasingly moderate. The reason being that these politicians now have to win over black voters and white voters. So they're reaching across the racial barrier and trying to appeal to everyone. A very good example of this would be to look at our former governor, Lawton Childs. For my students in your textbook, um, the book was actually published right at the end of Childs' administration. So, white Southerners, still solidly Democratic at the state and local level, but not at the national level anymore. White Southerners are swing voters during this period in presidential races. Black Southerners, however, solidly Democratic. When we get to about the mid-90s, white Southerners are very close to making the full transition. Uh, I don't know if this is coincidence, but this is about the time the Fox News Network began. White Southerners um, started considering maybe voting Republican at all levels. Newt Gingrich uh, led the, what we call the Gingrich Revolution. He expanded the number of white Southern Republicans in the U.S. House and in the U.S. Senate. Furthermore, it started trickling down to the state level and even the local level. By the time we get to the 2000s, White Southerners have left the Democratic Party, have actually changed their affiliation largely Republican, and Black Southerners, um, they're locked into the Democratic Party. So it's important to understand at this point that there was a period when White and Black Southerners were not terribly different as far as elections were concerned. They all pretty much voted for people like Lawton Child, so White Southern moderate Democrats were able to appeal across the racial barrier. But this brief period of unity would not last and it was broken down by the full transition of white Southerners into the Republican Party. Now that we understand that, I'm going to talk about the even more complicated racial dynamics of the state of Florida. So let's move on to the even more complicated racial dynamics in the state of Florida. We've got our usual white Southerners, black Southerners, but we also have a large number of white Northerners who've moved down over the years. White Northerners these days tend to be locked into the Democratic Party, so that's a voting base for the Democrats. Usually when you see white Democrats in the state of Florida, say in the legislature or at the U.S. level,
uh, these Democrats are not really native Floridians. They probably moved from up north, or they're descended from people who moved from up north. Furthermore, we have a very interesting Hispanic population in Florida. Anywhere else in the country, Hispanics are thought to be a voting base of the Democratic Party, but the Hispanics of Florida are rather unique. Most of them are from Cuba. Cubans, unlike other Hispanic groups, they tend to vote Republican for the most part. So you have a growing number of Republican Cubans who are working their way up. Uh, the best example of this would be a U.S. Senator, Marco Rubio. Note he is not at the state level, he is a U.S. Senator. So he of course comes from the Cuban community and he has served in the past in the Florida legislature. There is a minority of Cuban Democrats and they can win elections, but they are a minority. Most Cubans are Republicans. Then we've got lots of uh, immigrants from the Caribbean islands, from the Dominican Republic, from Haiti. Uh, they're hard to predict. Uh, they're slightly more likely to be Democrats, but they, they can be swing voters. So I don't really want to pigeonhole these groups. But they certainly make Florida unique in the context of the rest of the South. Because of all these different groups, Florida ends up being a very polarized swing state. What I mean by that is in presidential races, it could go Republican or Democratic, but it doesn't mean we're moderates. Black Southern Democrats, solidly Democratic. The Democrats know they can count on blacks not to vote Republican, but if they want to do well, they need to mobilize them. Keep in mind, just because they're not voting Republican doesn't mean that they vote. They might just stay home. So usually Democrats will try to mobilize the black voting base in Florida, just like they do throughout the South. For Republicans, uh, they want to mobilize the white voting base. Uh, the way you do that lately is you bash Obama, and you show pictures of your opponent shaking hands with Obama. Ooh. <laughs> You may remember that sort of thing from the last race in 2010 especially, when Marco Rubio was running against Charlie Crist um, for the Republican nomination, there were images of Charlie Crist uh, shaking Obama's hand. Ooh, he shook hands with the president. Oh, you can't trust that Charlie Crist. Well, Charlie Crist is a Democrat now, go figure. So on to the Cuban population. Republicans also do well to mobilize Cuban voters but they're probably not as solidly Republican as white Southerners have become. One thing to keep in mind is that Cubans are most likely to disagree with the Republican Party on immigration issues. It's possible that one of the reasons Mitt Romney lost the state of Florida in the last presidential race is because his immigration policy did not appeal well to Cubans. Um, I know Marco Rubio has been somewhat critical of him for that, and Rubio has also tried to change his mind on the issue of immigration uh, to no avail, as I understand. So, each party will mostly try to mobilize their base in the state of Florida, and they don't typically try to reach out to swing voters very much, at least in this particular state. For that reason, uh, the races get pretty nasty. Well, I'm talking about races for office now, not skin color races. But... Um, these races, whether for president, uh, for governor, for senate, for house, they get pretty nasty in the state of Florida, and there's a lot of mudslinging. And it's mostly convincing their own base that the other guy is so terrible that you'd better turn out and vote or else the other guy might win. You know, the guy who shook hands with Obama. Ooh, that never gets old. <laughs> so, um... Now we understand how their bases work, let's talk about their actual platforms and the issues they take up. Well, one thing to keep in mind about the state of Florida is that we have a very large elderly population and elderly people vote. So both parties have to think about that when they're running for office. What that means for the Republicans is they can't really afford to be libertarian style Republicans. They cannot afford to be Ron Paul or even his more moderate son Rand Paul for that matter. Elderly voters hate taxes. They're not that concerned about education because they're probably not going to school again. 
Uh, they love national security, they love their social security and their Medicare, and probably Medicaid as well. And they like to feel safe, so they like to know there's lots of police on the streets, uh, lots of firemen, and lots of prisons to hold those young punks in prison, you know, who smoked a little dope and went to the convenience store and bought a bag of Doritos. So, the way you appeal to elderly voters as a Republican and you talk about how you love the military, you talk about law and order and cracking down on crime, making them feel safe at night. Oh, and of course, it's not going to cost you one penny, we won't raise taxes. So, when it comes to education, uh, the Republicans have to find more cost-effective ways to promote education. And in this state, the Republicans have been pushing for school vouchers for some time. The idea there is that they hope the private schools will provide a better education than public schools. So, they would give parents a voucher from the state that is basically money that can be used for a private school. They hope that this is a cost-effective way of providing a quality education. Um, this has not been very successful. I've talked in other videos about how it was struck down by the Florida Supreme Court, etc. But that is something they're still pushing for. But Republicans will usually be very hesitant to increase educational spending overall. Now for Democrats, Democrats appeal to the elderly largely by talking about the entitlement program, Social Security and Medicare. They can't afford to go soft on crime either, and they can't afford to be anti-military. So you'll notice that in the state of Florida, even the most progressive of Democrats, they tend to be, uh, I guess we'll call it right wing on the subject of military. A good example of this would be Congresswoman Corrine Brown. She's in the Democratic Progressive Caucus. I want you to note she is a U.S. Congresswoman, not a state legislator. But um, she's very favorable to military spending. When it comes to our state legislature, they are as favorable as they can be. Keep in mind, this mostly comes from the federal government. But they're going to be very accommodating to the U.S. military as much as they can, in part because elderly people like it and also because it does provide jobs in the state of Florida. So Florida is a very pro-military state regardless of which party you're in. So both parties keep those things in mind when they're running for office. Now I'm going to talk a little next about the strategy of each party. You're going to find that they're rather different as far as how they try to win in this state. So let's start with the obvious. These days the Republicans call themselves the conservatives. The Democrats uh, more hesitantly call themselves the liberals. This is a terrible misuse of both of these terms, but I, I won't go into that right now. Uh, the Republicans like to talk about how conservative they are, etc. So if you want to appeal to the base of the Republican Party, that's how you do it. And one thing I want you to notice is in the state of Florida, the Republicans uh, will fight about how conservative they are. When you see a Republican primary, each Republican is trying to convince voters that they're more conservative than the other guy. You definitely saw that with Marco Rubio and Charlie Crist. You also saw this uh, in the gubernatorial race between Rick Scott and Bill McCollum. Each one said, well, he's too moderate, you should vote for me because I'm a real conservative. So, for the Republicans in this state, they don't try to reach out to moderates. It's mostly, I'm more conservative than the other guy. So, do you think the Democrats do the same thing the other way? Well, not in the state of Florida. If you go to California, maybe they do. But in Florida, the Democrats don't run on, I'm more liberal than the other Democrat. They usually run on, I'm moderate. I can actually win. The other guy, uh, he's too radical. He's going to lose. You saw this with Alex Sink, and I honestly can't even remember who her opponent was. It was a guy who actually was a socialist. He left the Socialist Party and switched Democratic. Well, Alex Sink uh, won that primary by a landslide, and Alex Sink never describes herself as a liberal. She usually describes herself as fiscally conservative and socially moderate. So while the Democrats are competitive in, state, in the state of Florida, I want you to note it is a bit of an uphill battle for them. They usually have to convince voters that they're good Democrats, as opposed to being those radical hippie Democrats from California or Oregon or wherever. 
So the Republicans, it's, you know, I'm Mr. Conservative. Um, they're not like Barry Goldwater, but, you know, they're all, oh, I'm so conservative. Where with the Democrats, it's I'm moderate, I'm middle of the road, I'm not too extreme. So that's the strategy you will typically see from the two parties when they're trying to win general elections. If they ignore that strategy, they do so at their peril. And a good example of that would be that last Senate race between Rubio, Charlie Crist, and the Democrat Kendrick Meek. Do you even remember Kendrick Meek? In a face-to-face -face class, I usually ask my students to try to remember who ran for Senate in 2010. Uh, most of them remember Rubio, most of them remember Crist, but I often have to remind them of Kendrick Meek. Well, Meek was the actual Democrat at the time. But Kendrick Meek kept bashing conservatives and talking about how progressive he was. Um, I got several emails from Kendrick Meek's campaign to that effect, and I actually responded to one of them. I said, you know, this is not going to help you in the state of Florida. Well, they ignored my email, and I mean, I'm just one person, but they didn't do well at all. Uh, Charlie Crist, the independent, did better than Kendrick Meek that time. Yes, Crist is now a Democrat, but he was an independent at the time. So that's the strategy you see from the two parties. Florida is a swing state, a purple state, but it is reddish. It leans a little more Republican than Democratic. And for the Democrats to win in this state, they have to keep that in mind. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the redrawing of districts and how that might affect the future of elections in Florida. So, as I explained earlier, typically districts in the southern states, including the state of Florida, are drawn down racial lines as much as they can get away with. So, you'll have this seat that is mostly blacks and perhaps white northerners. The Democrats cannot lose that seat, so you'll usually see a heated primary between two or three Democrats and the Republicans won't even try. In a Republican district, it's mostly white southerners. Um, you're going to have two or three different Republicans talking about how conservative they are, and the Democrats won't even take a crack at it. You might have an independent to shake things up. Well, that's going to change soon because we amended our state constitution, making it far more difficult to gerrymander, that is, to draw districts in a manipulative way. Um, there are still a large number of white Democrats in Florida, not just Northerners, but some remaining white Southern Democrats. My grandpa Ashmead was one of them. Uh, my grandmother, my father's side still alive, she would be one of them. So these white moderates, um, I think they could make a comeback in the state of Florida. If districts are much more competitive, then the Democrats might say, maybe we'd better pick a moderate. Um, they might win over enough, you know, a little bit of the Republican base that's getting sick of the Republicans for this reason or that, whatever it may be. And the Republicans might have to become a little more moderate also. I've noticed in the state of Florida that when the Republicans are trying to be moderate, they usually pick a black Republican, like uh, Jennifer Carroll, for example. Um, that always makes things interesting, and they hope that maybe she could win over some black voters. I have to admit, she gave Corrine Brown a run for her money many, many years ago. Corrine Brown still won, but it was a pretty good effort nonetheless. So, things are going to get very interesting in the next few election cycles as districts are redrawn, and all we can do right now is wait and see. Lastly, in the description below, I'm going to put a link to my blog. Um, this is not an academic blog, it's just where I sound off the top of my head mostly about politics or whatever. But there is a particular entry you might be interested in. I talked about the transition of white Southerners over to the Republican Party. Most of my examples are anecdotal, but it does show that maybe the way we're taught to think about this is not entirely accurate. Oh, what a relief it is. What a relief. 